rotate the screen. Press the button to rotate the screen. There it is. Now I can see you guys. Now we can go this way. This thing didn't turn on. Sounds like it's turning on now. All right, so one of the things, you guys got a chance to, who's, who's one group has submitted their group project three already? Woohoo, group 14. And I've realized that I should have given more instructions about exactly the format I wanted to see it in. And I've now realized that I'm gonna see about 25 different formats. And from those 25, I will pick the one that I like and those will be part of the instructions for next time I give this assignment. But thank you, Group 14, for being on the ball and handing that in. Um, but it did dawn on me that there's going to be a lot of different formats you guys give me since I didn't specify how to, how to put it together. So use your judgment. You certainly won't be penalized because it wasn't the format I was expecting since I didn't expect one. Um, all right. One of the things that we talk about, though, we talk about uh, estimating costs, it, especially, and this is so, it's something that you have to figure out if you're building one of these startups. But, um, but in general, there's a shop rate. And the shop rate And I think we talked on that very first day, we said shop rates around this area range from about 60 to about $120 an hour. And so what they do with that shop rate is they figure out all of their overhead costs. And by figure out, I mean they make an educated guess. Over OVE. So what, what, what goes into overhead costs? Just very quickly, shout out some things. Yeah. So things like rent, utilities, pay the secretary if you get somebody that's in a reception area answering the phone, things like that, the CEO's salary. So, so things like that are the overhead. These are the expenses that the company's going to pay whether they're making parts or not. And um, so we, we figure out the total of our overhead costs. And we say, all right, here's, here's a method for figuring it out. You could say, we're going to have these three machines. They're going to operate 10 hours a day. In, if they're operating 10 hours a day, how much do we have to charge for each hour in order to make sure that we pay for all of our overhead costs? So that's, that's a way to figure it out. And so if we say that a shop has a shop rate of $65 an hour and they've got three machines running at the same time, for each of those machines, they're charging $65 an hour for that hour, not just for the fact that they're operating for that hour. Does that make sense? And so you're going to see this in, uh, in at least one quiz question or exam question where we talk about the shop rate. And so... If I've got five machines that are working at the same time, I'm charging that shop rate by those five machines. Okay, so it doesn't matter how you break it up. So that's the shop rate. And it's just a way, if, if we've got a good understanding of our overhead costs and how often our machines are going to be running, we can figure out a good shop rate. And then when a part comes in, we can say, well, that's going to take about 25 minutes of machining time. It's going to take about a half an hour to set it up, right? So if we say it's going to take a half an hour to set it up, twenty min to machine, and fifteen min to breakdown. So these are both non-productive costs, right? In our lean class, we would want to get rid of our non-productive costs or minimize those as much as we can. But if it's 30 minutes to set up, 50 minutes to break down, 20 minutes to do the machining, for all of, so this is what, 50, 65, for 65 minutes, that machine is unavailable for anything else. 
So we want to attribute our shop rate for those 65 minutes. If our shop rate is 60, the math gets easier, right? It's a dollar a minute. So to make one of these parts, it costs $65. So the minimum that we have to charge our customer is that $65. Now we could add profit to that and we could charge our customer more if the customer is willing to pay, right? So what's it cost to make two parts now? One part costs $65. What's two parts cost? $85, which is how much per part? $42.50 per part. So if they order one part, it's $65 per part. If they order two parts, it's $42.50. If they order 1,000 parts, you don't have to do the math. But, but there's a number where the significance of these two numbers goes away, right? And, and pretty much it's only what, how much time does it take to machine the part because the rest of it gets lost in the noise. Okay, but there's, um, so when we talk about shop rate, that's how we use that shop rate term. That clear? All right, let's move on then. So today, I bet you my head is really big on the YouTube Live right now. Today, oh, a couple of housekeeping things while I log into the site here. Um, so the week six Friday quiz is posted. Um, the final exam will be posted by midnight tonight. I've just I've, I've created it. I'm just loading the questions into it right now. You will have 168 hours to complete the final exam. One week to complete the final exam. It's online, open book, open notes. It is an individual exercise. You may not talk to each other about it once you have started. So you can talk to each other about it as much as you want until you've clicked the button to open the exam, and then you have to stop talking about it. Okay, until you're done and the person you're talking to is done, then you can talk about it again. But don't talk to people in the class about the exam while it's ongoing, while they're doing it. Okay, individual exercise. Yes. That's the next thing I was going to talk about. On all the other quizzes we did, we did multiple attempts. A few of you noticed that it was grading the last attempt and not the highest graded attempt. And that was always my intent, but I've rethought it just a little bit. I'm going to go back and turn all those on to grade the highest attempt um, because I don't think there's any loss to anybody by doing that. It'll only improve a few, it'll, few people. It'll improve their grade. For some people, it won't matter. But um, so that's all the other quizzes. Final exam has one attempt. You get the questions once. You have 168 hours to answer them. If something goes wrong and your computer screws up and you get kicked out before you're finished, let me know, I'll reset it for you. But it has one attempt, so there's no multiple attempts. And the purpose here is to figure out, did you actually learn anything or are you just really good at retaking the test? Right, because you get 100% by retaking the test without having learned anything, it's possible. There are new, brand new questions on the test. All of the questions are of a similar format of a question that you've had before. So there's nothing brand new on the final exam. It's a recap, it's a comprehensive pulling together of the things we already did. So it might not be the same numbers, but it'll be the same math. So if you knew how to solve the question before, you should know how to solve the question now, which means everybody should be able to get 100% on it. It's worth 15 points on the final grade, so 15% of the final grade. The other thing that we're doing now, who, has anybody started their lab practical exam yet? Those will be starting this week and next week. So you'll be doing the lab practical exam where you take your base, you put it in the machine tool, you safely run one machining operation on your part that engraves, it probably engraves a term 18 on it. Pretty sure that's what it's gonna say. 
if you follow all the steps on the safety checklist and you don't crash the machine tool, you get 100%. If you do crash the machine tool or you skip one of the safety steps but it doesn't crash anyway, you get, I believe it's 25% deducted for each step you skip. And I believe crashing is an automatic failure. But if you fail, you must take it again. It's like a driver's test. We want everybody to pass. And you, you can't get a full score if you fail the first time. But um, there's that. If there's a step you don't know how to do on the safety checklist, and you ask the TA or the PLA who's giving you the exam, how do I do that step? There's a five point deduction from your score. There's six things on the safety checklist. So if you got asked the TA how to do each of the steps and they showed you how to do it and you did it, you could get a 70 on the test. Because the purpose of the test is to help you identify where the edge of your knowledge is. If you know you don't know how to do anything, I don't want you to crash the machine trying. So know where the edge of your knowledge is. So that's the, that's the two things that are still open besides this, I guess, the group assignment, except for group 14. You guys are done with that. Um, group assignment, final exam, lab practical, and quiz six, which is due Friday night. Okay, that's what's still left to go. Uh, any questions on that? Yeah. It will be 15 points. It'll probably be around 20 questions. Um, that, that was, I was wondering that question myself this morning. We could do more questions with lower point value, but then there'd be repeat of concepts. And I don't, I don't think there's a lot, big need to repeat concepts. Anybody ever taken a psychological evaluation test? I did do one once for a security clearance. And um, it was amazing. It was about 270 questions. But it was really only about 15 questions. <laughs> asked over and over again with different wording to track your pattern of answers to that question, not your specific, because if it's 15 questions, you can figure out the right answer, right? Psychological evaluation. My favorite question from that test. I actually, in the, in the psychiatrist's office, a bunch of us taking this test all at the same time, taking the test, and I had to stop because I was laughing too hard at the question. My favorite question from the whole test was, do you think often about not killing yourself. Now you want to get the security clearance, so you want to answer the question correctly. That's a hard one to answer correctly. I'm not even sure I know what the correct answer is. But do you think often about not killing yourself? That won't be on the test. <laughs> that, that should be a bonus question. Extra credit. Um, okay, what are we talking about today? GD and T, right? Geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Anybody know what that is? Do you know what it means? There's people that know what it means. I guarantee it. Who took ES 1310? Somebody, you took ES 1310. Okay. What's your name? Brian. Brian. You took ES 1310. You should be able to give this lecture, right? Talk about GD&T and T in ES 1310, don't you? What, what, so give us a nutshell. What do you remember? about GD&T from ES 1310. And if you can't, you should probably ask for your money back. <laughs> so what's GD&T? Just, just rough terms. He's the tutor for the class. I love it. This is fun. So let's just GD&T as a term itself. We don't have to get into the tolerances themselves yet. That's what today's lecture is about. But GD&T, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, so remember we said we're going from art to part in this class? Right? We're the manufacturing engineers. Our goal is to make the part. The art over here, who's responsible for the art? The designer. The designer's job The designer's job is to make the art. The art is the representation of the concept, right? The thing that we're, we're representing it. So this is a drawing, right? It's usually at a minimum a drawing. 
might be a sketch. It could be a drawing, it could be a sketch. At my manufacturing company, we have a service we call napkin to part. If you sketch on a bar napkin the thing you want to make, take a picture of it and email it to us, we will make the part. We will probably have to have our engineering people talk to you some, somewhat before we actually ship you the part. But we call that service napkin to part. Come to us with a concept, we'll ship you a part. Okay, so there's a drawing, there's a sketch, there's something that represents it. This GD&T stuff is part of the drawing, and it's how you represent the dimensions on the drawing. So there's rules for GD&T that tell you how to write the dimensions down. You guys, who else took 1310? Really? You took 1310. When I was a kid, everybody had to take it. I think it was even required for Emmys. Who's an Emmy? You guys haven't taken 1310. <coughs> well, yeah, now we call it the SolidWorks class. When I took it, they taught us how to roll the pencil as we're pulling the pencil across the paper to make sure the line thickness always stayed the same because different line thicknesses mean different things to the GD&T people. They don't make you take it anymore? How are you going to be an engineer? How are you going to express your concept and send it to the, the manufacturing people? I'm flabbergasted. I used to ask this question and half the hands would go up. They, who's, who's thinking about taking it now? Okay, that's better. <laughs> um, so gd and part of it is what's the correct way to draw the symbol on the paper so that people know what you meant? That's part of gd and That's not so much the part we're going to talk about today because I don't really know that part. When I look at the symbols on the paper, half the time I have to go look them up. But you can. You can Google it. gd and symbols. You can find those. So geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is the rules for how we represent on our drawing or on our sketch, the information about, getting too excited, my microphone's falling off, about the, uh, the parts that we want. The T part is tolerancing. I would argue for a mechanical designer Tolerancing is the engineering part that you do. It's a significant, so what else do you do that's engineering? All right, stress analysis. Do stress analysis, that's engineering. What else do you do as a designer that's engineering? I think that's it. Does the physics work? All right, if you're designing like a, you're designing a thing to throw the chalk and have it hit the table, you might have to understand ballistics and the physics. So there's some engineering there too. There's some math there. But this is the engineering part that makes sure that you get the part that you asked for. Okay, what's a tolerance? So it's a range. Say it again. For part part dimensions. So it's a range of part dimensions. Anybody anybody disagree? A tolerance is a range of dimensions on a part. Who's ever made an engineering drawing and put in, put tolerances on it? How did you pick the tolerance you put on the drawing? I was at my internship. You had your internship and you did whatever they told you to. So you used engineering judgment, but not yours. Yeah. Right. Someone else. Do you guys have engineering judgment, by the way? Yes. Do you have a lot of it? No. How do you get more? Do more engineering. Okay. So, but engineering judgment, uh, we also call it what? Swag, scientific, wild ass guess. We sometimes call it estimate. I sometimes call it intuitive engineering. 
just sort of knowing what the right answer is because you have experience with this. You guys have heard swag before, right? I didn't just introduce the term. Okay. Um, art part tolerance is range for parts. What does this range of dimensions that are expressed that express the tolerance do for us as manufacturers? Exactly. This range of dimensions allows us as manufacturers to screw up. It's our screw up factor. So if we have a part here, and we want it to be five inches long, I'm doing my sketch now, maybe three inches wide. Now why would a designer pick a piece of material that's five inches long and three inches wide? Yep. Yeah, all right, but say, say the finished part is a block that's five inches wide and three inches across. So if that's our finished part, why does the designer pick that? The designer picks that because that's what they believe fulfills the customer need. They believe the customer needs a block that's three inches wide, five inches long. And maybe it's got a thickness too. We'll draw that. So 0.75. We actually have lab exercises that we do in a different class, not your class, that we have the people in the class make us blocks that are five inches long, three inches wide, three quarters of an inch tall, and that five is plus or minus 0 0.001 inches. Oh, and then there's a parallel parallelism spec that we put on there is also, I forget what it is, but we want the side, we want the ends to be, we don't want a parallelogram. We don't want a trapezoid. We want the corners to be square. And we want this dimension to be 001 plus or minus. Why do we do that in that class? Because we want to see that that class is about teaching the students how to quickly set up the machine tool and how to make parts of an accurate size while after they've quickly set up the machine tool. We make them all make five of these parts before they're allowed to move on and graduate the class. We pick 001 because it's sufficiently hard for them to do in the mini mill with lack of experience. You know what this part's for though? The next operation is we cut it in half with a bandsaw and we use it for the Y block stock for your class. <laughs> So we certainly didn't need 0 0.001 dimension on that part if the next operation was cut it in half with a bandsaw, right? But we did need that dimension because the purpose of the part was to teach the class. Okay, so our customer need for the part was to have a part that the students would find challenging to make. That was my customer need. That's why that dimension was 001. All right, so we pick the tolerances, or we pick the overall dimensions because we believe it fills our customer need. We pick the tolerances to allow the manufacturers to screw up. Now, what if I change the tolerance? And so by removing a zero from the tolerance here, I've, I've what we call, I've loosened the tolerance on that dimension. So tightening the tolerance adds zeros. Loosening the tolerance removes zeros. That's, that's a way to look at it. So what happens when I loosen the dimension? Oh, by the way, the first time I did this exercise with that class, there's 12 people in the class. They need to each make five of these good blocks before we let them move on. The first time we did that exercise, they scrapped 24 feet of material. No, don't worry, because I can still cut them in half of the bandsaw and use them for M1800. Whether they were over or under, they're still good parts for me. But they scrapped 24, 12 people scrapped 24 feet of material in order to each get, so five, this is about 
But you get two of them out of a foot, so there's about two times 12, 24 of them in a bar. 12 times 5 is 60. We needed 60 good parts. They scrapped two bars of material. Uh, we, we buy 12 foot bars. They bandsaw cut them to just over five, then square the ends. Um, oh, so what is, what would loosening the tolerance do to my scrap rate? So I, I scrapped 24, I wanted 60. What's the scrap rate? 24 is what percent of 60? Like a third, a little bit more than a third, right? Like 35%? So I had a 35% scrap rate on this operation. What would loosening the tolerance do for me? It's going to decrease my scrap rate. I'm going to make more good parts if I loosen the tolerance. What would tightening the tolerance do for me? Actually, I'm pretty sure it would, if I added a zero there, I'm pretty sure it would send my scrap rate to infinity. I don't think they would have made it. I mean, and part of that comes down to process capability, right? We talked about process capability early in the, in the term. And so if our process is not capable, then we've got too tight of a tolerance. So when we looked at that process capability, the tolerance was one of the things that we had to consider in that process capability, right, in our ca capability calculations. The larger the tolerance, the easier it was to have a capable process. Okay, um, so loosen the tolerances, you, in, you decrease scrap rate, tighten the tolerances, you increase, you are likely to increase scrap rate. There's some range where it's not going to have any impact. Um, this is a bilateral tolerance. Because it's plus or minus some amount from the basic dimension or the nominal. So the designer says it's got to be five inches. All right, what can we put a tolerance on? Wait, I know one length. We can put a tolerance on length. What else can we put a tolerance on? Height, width. We can put a tolerance on linear dimensions. What else can I put a tolerance on? Diameter again, but that's sort of a linear dimension again. We can put a tolerance on surface finish. The symbol for noting surface finish on a drawing looks sort of like the, uh, what is that, the square root symbol? Looks sort of like that. And you put, some, you put some numbers out here, put some numbers in here, and it tells you what that tolerance is. When I want to draw it on the drawing, I go look up the symbol, so make sure I use it right. When I want to understand the drawing somebody gave me, I go look up the symbol to make sure I understand it right. The symbols that you often deal with in your day-to-day -day work, you'll remember what they mean. The symbols that you don't often deal with in your day-to-day -day work, I would recommend Google. G, D, and T. Oh, look, it popped up. There's some lists of them. So you can learn what they mean. You can learn how to use them. Okay. So, and, and that's important. Why, oh, why is it important to use the right symbol on your drawing? Yeah. Do you get the part you thought you get? You helps you, it helps you get the part you thought you get. <laughs> it helps you communicate to the person who's receiving the drawing and doing that. Um, why is it especially important to draw the symbol correctly and to know what all the little parts of the symbol mean. Well, they're, they're used everywhere. There's actually national and international standards that defines what these symbols are. I didn't look to see which one this copyrighted image came from, but uh, or maybe copyrighted image. I once read a textbook about copyright law because it was on my friend's copy table. I'm pretty sure as soon as I publish it, I have implied the copyright. And I own the copyright simply by publishing it, whether I claim or state the copyright. Now, I could give you certain copyrights. So I can tell you you're allowed to share it. 
But it's up to me to decide that. And if I don't say that, it's my copyrighted picture. But anyway, not, enough about copyright law. Okay. Um, so our screw up factor, symbols, look up the symbols. Do they teach any of this in, in 1310 now? What symbols to use? No? They used to. We had, we, had to, we had to memorize these things. By the way, did you note that the final exam is open book, open notes? You don't have to memorize anything. Engineers shouldn't ever have to memorize anything. The things that you use all the time, you will remember what they are. The things that you don't use all the time, you can use reference material to look them up. So unless you love memorizing stuff, don't spend a lot of time memorizing stuff. My advice to you, life advice, tolerances, how do you express them? So we can locate things. We can locate things like holes, right? We can specify the dimensions of the hole and the tolerance for the dimensions of the hole. We can put tolerances on surface roughness. Sometimes being too smooth is bad. Sometimes being too rough is bad. So you can have upper and lower bounds on these tolerances. Um, we usually try to say a nominal number or a basic number and then a plus or minus or a bilateral tolerance. In some instances, that's impractical. And we'll talk about that here. What time? Good, plenty of time, plenty of time. So why might I want to use a unilateral tolerance? So when I express a unilateral tolerance, I might put a number like uh, 0.2500, oh, oh, no, yeah, 0.2500 oh, oh, plus 0 minus 0.005. Oh, 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 so what does that mean? If that's, if that's a dimension, so that's a linear dimension that locates something, what do I mean when I say 0.2500? Plus zero minus o o o five. Right. So if it's bigger than point two five by even one ten thousandth of an inch. So if I if I measure point two five o one, that's a scrap part. Right. But if I measure 4995.24, you'd think my fours and nines look the same. 0.2495, that's a good part. Why would I, so let's say it's a whole diameter. Say that's the linear dimension for our whole diameter. Why would I ever want to do that? How else could I express it? I could pick the point halfway between 2495 and 2500, and I could put a bilateral tolerance of two and a half tenths. Right? Oh, this is a tenth, right? Remember the beginning of the term I said we're going to have to learn some machine shop speak? So that when you, what do you guys, when you graduate? There's a term for you when you graduate from WPI, from any university. You go out and work in manufacturing. What's that? Somebody said something, I didn't hear it. Yeah? Kids with CAD. We call you guys kids with CAD when you first get to industry. Because you're really good at using that CAD software, like SolidWorks, like Autodesk, like whatever one it is that you're using. You're really good at that. You're not really good at choosing tolerances. Oh. You think tighter tolerances or looser tolerances are more expensive? Tighter tolerances are more expensive every time. Why? What's that? So it could be more scrap parts. It's frequently you need a more expensive machine to make it. Right? So if my if my length tolerance on my 5-inch block is plus or so 5 right 5 plus or minus point 0.1. So what's point 0.1? That's 100 thou. So if my length tolerance is 100 thou on this, 
I cut it with a bandsaw. I can hit a hundred thou with a bandsaw. I gotta be careful to hit hundred thou. Certainly if it's two hundred thou, I can hit it with a bandsaw. Right? So if it's one thou, if it's one thou, I'm gonna have to cut it with a bandsaw probably to get it close to the right dimension. Then I'm gonna have to put it in some sort of a machine tool and I'm gonna have to cut it. Not only that, if it's 200 thou, that's almost a quarter of an inch, right? I can look at it with a tape measure and know if I got it right. So the tighter tolerances require a more expensive machine and more expensive metrology, right? Plus or minus a thou on this part, hard to measure it with caliper. Certainly if you want that parallelism, the square corners and the parallelism, it's really hard to measure it with a caliper, so you're gonna have to use a micrometer or a height gauge. All these things get more expensive. Okay, so what does it tell you? So let's, I'll make, I'll make this five. So whole diameter, 0.25 plus zero minus five thou. What does it tell you about the hole? It probably means that we're going to take a pin that's 0 0.2501 maybe, or 0 0.251, and we're going to press it in there with a force fit. And maybe the tolerance on this one is 0 0.2500 plus 0 0.001 minus zero. So if they're both the same, I should have gone with 0.5 because my, my example here is 0.5. Is it 0.5? It's 0.65. No way. That really looks like a half-inch dowel pin. I think this is mislabeled. It says the nominal diameter is 0.65, but I think it's 0.5. We'll fix that. Um, so I've got some holes here where I can put it in and it rattles around. And I've got some holes here where I can just barely fit it in. In fact, there's some corrosion on the dowel pin, which is impeding my ability to put it in this particular hole. Um, I'll go ahead and pass this around so you guys can get a feel. Um, so if I want to do this force fit, or if I wanted to do a slip fit, or if I wanted it to rattle around like this, right? So what's this? this is like a, uh, what's a crappy car that they make these days? Does anybody make any bad cars anymore? Any car manufacturers make bad cars these days that sell in the U.S.? Pretty much they're all fit together these days. But all right, let's say it's a 1968 Datsun. or a 1968 Mercedes. And that's sort of the difference between the way the things slip together. Now, which one was cheaper to make? The Datsun, because it had looser tolerances, right? That's why it was cheaper to make. Um, this is kind of heavy, I'll pass it around. You guys can get a, a feel for the different kinds of fits. If I want to know what dimension to choose here, and this is what I was actually getting to in, in 1310 was they tell you how to represent the dimensions on the drawings, but not necessarily how to pick the right ones. So how do I choose what the right dimension is? Yep. It does depend on the type of fit you want. But even if I know I want a really tight fit or I want a really loose fit, so I, I've, I've got an intuition about what type of fit I want. How do I choose the right dimensions? Yeah. If you're doing a force fit, then definitely the, the material properties of the different materials matters a lot. Uh, but let's let's just say we just want we want the part to slip through. So I want the I want the part to fit in the hole and slide through without a lot of wiggling. How do I know? So 
for example, the piston fit with the cylinder in our Sterling engine. That's a sliding fit. It's a running sliding fit. I can tell you that the optimal allowance, so the allowance is the difference between the small, so if I've got, so here's my hole and here's my pin. The difference between the, if it's a forced fit, sorry, if it's a clearance fit, it's the difference between the largest pin that we will allow and the smallest hole that we will allow. That's the allowance. The difference between the, if it's a slip fit. Okay, so how do I know what the right allowance is? I can tell you how we knew for the Sterling engine, but the allowance is uh, eight ten thousandths of an inch on the Sterling engine. That's our target allowance. <coughs> so we know that because we made cylinders and we made pistons and we did operational tests to see what was the optimal. Because if I make that cylinder piston fit too tight, there's too much friction. If I make it too loose, the air blows past it and doesn't push the piston out. So we did operational tests. We did an experiment to determine what the right sizes were. If we want to use engineering judgment, we probably aren't going to do an experiment every time we want to fit something together. So what else could we do? So if you've got engineering judgment, if you've been doing this for a long time, then you might just know the answer. But you guys don't have that much engineering judgment yet. You're getting there. You'll get some. What else could we do? We could look it up in some reference material. So we could bring back our machinery's handbook. Right, we've seen this already this term. If we don't remember how to find the machinery's handbook, we could watch the video. Or you could Google search WPI machinery's handbook and it will find the video for you. And you can note that you go to the Gordon Library website. This video is pretty slow. I was clicking slow that day. Type machinery's handbook in the search bar. Click search. Come on, click search. Oh, look, it finds it in the catalog. Now, the current edition is the 30th edition. It's in there. Um, it really doesn't matter which edition you look at. These things haven't changed much since then. If you go to the 30th edition, you might want to go down to whatever I clicked on there. And you're going to find the section on allowances for tolerances and fits. And in this section, oops. All right, done with the video. You can read. You guys know how to do that, right? You can read. Good. You can read this paragraph. After you read that paragraph, you can skim through the paragraphs that follow, and you can learn some definitions for some words that we, we use when we talk about these things. Once you've done that, you should go to the pages. Come on. Go the other direction. There's some pages that have tables like this. They tell us, so you're, you're looking at running sliding fits right now, these RC fits that's passing around the room. It tells you the nominal size for the hole, the nominal size for the pin, depending on what type of fit that you want. So you can classify the fit. Let's see, you can look it up there. What else do they talk about? Yeah, let's see. How much time we got left? Three. Three minutes, okay. The next thing that's really important for you guys to understand here, um, who's ever bolted two things together? Who's never bolted two things together? Nobody's willing to admit it, okay. 
if if you just are not willing to admit that you've never bolted two things together, go over to the shop sometime, help hours or something like that, and ask for two things that can be bolted together so you can have that experience before you graduate from WPI. Um, how easy is it to bolt two things together if we have one hole? Very, right? What's our chance of success if there's one hole? Well, I mean, one hole in each thing, right? As long as the hole's big enough for the bolt to fit through, right? What about two holes? What impacts our ability to put two bolts in the plate, in the plates that we want to bolt together? Assume that the bolt can fit through any of the holes. So if we got two plates, there's four holes. Assume that the bolt can fit through all four of the holes. But when we put the two plates together, can the bolt necessarily fit through all four of the holes still? No. And what impacts our ability to put the bolt through the holes? The tolerance on the spacing of the holes and the tolerance on the diameter of the holes. Both of them, right? So when the, when, the four, when the two holes don't line up, what do you do? One thing you do, scrolling the scroll wheel doesn't go through here, huh? One of these, is that the one? Yeah, that's the one. One thing that you do when they don't close right is go get a bigger hammer, right? Who's done it? Raise your hands. Be proud. The bolt almost goes through the hole. So you tap it with a hammer to make it go through the hole. So when, when, that, when you're in that condition, it's a condition called bolt bound. What happens if there's a third hole now? You need an even bigger hammer? I actually had a really good bigger hammer video that was the guy using a jackhammer on the end of a backhoe to make the rock fit in the hole. That was fun, too. Um, all right, so get a bigger hammer. Or, as we like to say in the industry, waller out the hole, right? You drill a bigger hole for one of them. Um, and so getting those tolerances correct will allow you to assemble your parts so that you don't have to get a bigger hammer and you don't have to waller out the holes. This guy's passionate. Wow. Look at... You know, you're not allowed to judge other people's Google suggestion, YouTube suggested videos. It's, again, it's uncool to judge other people's suggested videos. 